issues. Uh, we're here tonight to uh, discuss the 10 year telecommunications plan. Uh, this is our third public hearing uh, on the plan, actually fourth. Uh, if you count the legislative hearing we had on Tuesday. And um, we're here to get uh, public input on the plan. Uh, with me tonight is Matt Dunn um, from uh, RISI and CTC. They're the consultants that were hired to uh, create the plan. And so they've published, uh, or we have published a final draft. And uh, we're here tonight to get comment on that final draft. Um, before we uh, adopt the plan. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt for an abbreviated um, uh, introduction to the plan. And then we're gonna go to public comment. Um, given tonight that we have a pretty healthy audience here in Craftsbury, um, we may start with the Craftsbury folks and then we'll move to, um, to the folks online to take their comments. So. With that, Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you, Clay. I'm not sure if you can see my screen currently. We can. Great, excellent. Uh, well, it is uh, great to be with you all. Uh, it's been a, uh, a an interesting couple of weeks doing uh, this presentation. We were I was in uh, Springfield uh, myself yesterday uh, to do the presentation. Uh, and it's uh, great to be uh, beaming into you uh, in, in Cabot uh, from, from here in Heartland. Uh, I'm going to uh, do this a little bit more quickly so we can get to comments. Um, the, uh, the, the 10 year telecommunication plan is obviously a, uh, a 300 page plus document. Uh, this is meant to just give a quick overview uh, to, to frame how we arrived at this uh, plan and the focus. Um, and I'm just going to walk through it very quickly, given given the the time and the the interest that is here. Um, so we've zeroed in on creating this 10 year plan based on the moment that we're in, uh, which is a time coming out of the uh, pandemic, uh, where the the uh, focus on having universal broadband to every person in the state of Vermont is uh, front and center on people's minds, uh, and fortunately on the minds of appropriators, uh, both at the state and at the federal level. Uh, so we really zeroed in on how to create, how to uh, uh, ensure that uh, future-proof infrastructure was put in place uh, using those resources and that momentum uh, in the near term. There are obviously lots of pieces to the uh, comprehensive plan that we uh, did address, um, but this was where we uh, focused most of our time and attention. Uh, part of that was doing a, uh, a renewed analysis of where uh, there is still uh, uh, broadband that is below uh, what is considered served by the FCC, uh, which is uh, lower than 25 megabits down and three megabit up service, which is what you would typically get uh, from cable service. Uh, and we then also did analysis to estimate the approximate cost. Uh, this represents by our analysis, 51,000 premises uh, across the state of Vermont. Uh, and our estimate is that to reach those premises with 100 over 100 fiber to the home surface, uh, service, uh, which we'll talk about why we zeroed in on that, uh, is a cost of between 360 million and 440 million. Uh, the, the difference there uh, really being uh, whether you count as a premise to serve those uh, entities that are considered camps uh, and those that are not considered camps. Uh, and that's where the uh, that range uh, comes from. Uh, the, the ARPA stimulus money that has been appropriated uh, to date and that is uh, available to be appropriated in the year to come actually pr provides a unique opportunity to uh, make a huge dent uh, in this process and the resources that it could leverage through public and private partnerships uh, as well as the resources that we hope will also come through from a infrastructure bill from Congress uh, could get us all the way there. 
Uh, these are the core values that we followed in developing this plan, focusing on uh, efficiency, uh, longevity, local control, uh, which has been uh, uh, reiterated in the uh, legislation that has come out recently that CUDs should be a, uh, the communication union districts should be a primary vehicle for distributing these resources and uh, prioritizing how those resources are using and achieving this goal. And then equity uh, to make sure that uh, first and foremost, there's the infrastructure to ensure that all Vermonters have access to uh, high speed internet uh, regardless of geography, uh, and that they not only have the access to infrastructure, but they are able to uh, obtain that connectivity uh, regardless of income race or any other factor. Um, the On the terrestrial broadband front of bringing uh, fiber to the home and meeting the state's uh, goal of 100 over 100 service uh, has gotten a little bit uh, complicated by uh, funding efforts that have gone on from the feds over the last uh, year. Uh, the RDOF uh, reverse auction uh, that uh, came through uh, provided subsidy to, uh, to certain internet service providers in concentrated areas uh, and then uh, to uh, wireless providers and other non-fiber uh, uh, to the home providers in other areas. And it just made the overall planning of a sustainable uh, uh, broadband uh, network uh, a, a little more difficult. And so it's it's uh, certainly come into account as we were doing our analysis, uh, but it has made the, the planning process a, a little more challenging. Um, it's important to note that the stimulus money is going everywhere in the country and it is creating an intense labor and market demand which means that the construction uh, costs are, are going to be variable uh, based on those. Uh, and the third thing that we just want to make sure uh, everyone understands is that communication union districts uh, vary widely. Uh, some are very mature, having uh, actually you know, deployed broadband and run an ISP for a number of years, and others that have just uh, finished uh, forming with it all uh, volunteer boards. So there is going to be a real need for uh, support uh, by both financially and, and technical and legal to the CUDs to allow them to be successful in meeting this goal and being the vehicle for meeting this goal. We did uh, you know, look at the legislation that the uh, was moving through uh, the legislature uh, this year. We actually had arrived at a similar uh, framework uh, on our own, uh, and we believe that there is uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, good in, in how that uh, legislation came together. We provided a little more uh, specifics in, in our recommendations in order to be able to get uh, to the uh, last mile. But we also uh, stated that it would be really important uh, for the resources to be prioritizing those locations that do not currently have 25-3. Uh, and the reason is that those are the places where there is a market failure currently, which is why they don't have 25-3 to date. And this investment would actually allow those uh, communities uh, and, and locations to leapfrog to gigabit speed internet uh, at a, uh, in a uh, mechanism that can be scaled uh, over time. So certainly starting with a minimum of 100 over 100, um, but with fiber to the home, it can scale as demand uh, grows, uh, which it is at approximately 20 to 30 percent uh, speed uh, demand increases uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and the, the other uh, assumption that's in there is that in the places where the marketplace did uh, uh, encourage cable to be um, deployed already, uh, those premises will be fine in the near term and the market forces are likely to bring those to, uh, to 100 over 100 capability, uh, either through overbuilding um, that we're seeing some ISPs doing and bringing fiber uh, to those locations or in the advancements in cable deployment. Uh, we do not think that's a guarantee by any stretch. Um, but there is a good reason to believe that those those uh, locations will get faster and faster broadband 
um, which is why if there are limited resources, they should go to those places that uh, aren't being currently served uh, by the market. Um, we have a number of different uh, additional considerations uh, given uh, H360 uh, as passed, which I'm not going to go into detail on, but we have included uh, in the in the plan. Um, we've also included uh, technical standards uh, for the subsidized network deployments that we think are critical in order to make sure that the uh, infrastructure is robust, uh, does not uh, have uh, host remote isolation or other challenges if not built well, um, that there's interoperability and that it can support other kinds of capacity including uh, self-service expansion, uh, as well as public safety. Um, the, we also look to the long-term. This is a 10-year plan, which is a challenging thing to do uh, with given the rapid transformation of technology over a decade. Um, but in uh, within that 10-year plan, uh, we believe that CUDs can, once they completed a deployment, uh, be directly involved in helping ensure that uh, now that the infrastructure is available, uh, that all individuals have access to that broadband um, and uh, can get uh, access to the devices and the skills necessary to uh, take advantage of that world-class broadband. Obviously doing so in collaborations with uh, libraries, schools, PEG television, uh, many of the social service organizations around the state, um, but CUDs have a have a, a, a potential role to play to be um, that center of uh, equal access to broadband uh, that we are all uh, uh, hoping for. Uh, certainly, mobile broadband uh, and cellular service are are a critical piece to the overall. Uh, broadband infrastructure. I will start out by saying that doing fiber to the home uh, and a, a robust uh, symmetrical system will significantly advance the opportunity to bring uh, mobile to the rest of the state. So it's it's the right priority to be putting uh, front and center. Um, we, we did do a new propagation uh, analysis uh, as well as match that with some of the uh, driving analysis that was done by the department to be able to get uh, a sense of where there is uh, mobile and where there's not. As was pointed out yesterday, uh, there has been deployments uh, since this uh, analysis was done, uh, and uh, including the driving. Um, so there may be some additional places that are covered. Um, but to be clear, the, the number of, of places, uh, addresses uh, that are uh, covered is still not uh, a, a, a huge number, particularly if you're wanting to get cell service indoors. Um, now, uh, cell service indoors can be addressed if there's high speed internet through uh, using uh, Wi Fi uh, mobile uh, uh, mechanisms, um, but uh, still 40% of the addresses are not uh, covered uh, on an outdoor basis and it's going to be uh, important to continue the march down the road to be able to uh, get greater and greater coverage. This is analysis uh, in terms of uh, uh, road coverage, uh, which is important for safety. Uh, clearly, there's been a fair bit of progress on class one roads, um, but that's a very small percentage, less than 1% of the total road, road miles in the state. Uh, and other uh, types of roads that make up uh, 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 the majority uh, of the road miles um, are, are just over 50% uh, covered. We do have some recommendations of how uh, public funds could be used uh, effectively uh, to uh, in invite public-private partnerships to the table in order to be able to deliver uh, uh, more mobile coverage. Um, some of those could be, you know, all private. Some of them could be public-private. Some of them could be uh, largely public. Um, and we we provide a a mechanism for uh, doing that uh, through an RFP process that would be collaborative in nature and really focused on uh, solutions that uh, can be deployed. Uh, given the topography of Vermont, but also uh, Vermonters' aversion to uh, certain tower infrastructure. 
so we, we do get into that detail if there is the uh, uh, willingness to uh, allocate funds for uh, mobile uh, service deployment. Uh, we do have uh, a fair bit in the uh, plan uh, on the uh, uh, on public safety needs, uh, specifically on uh, land mobile radio infrastructure uh, that uh, is is aging in many parts of the state and needs uh, upgrades uh, because um, neither FirstNet uh, nor other services are reliable enough uh, for public safety. Uh, and we also are, uh, put in the plan the, uh, the types of uh, funding that is available at the federal level uh, specifically to underwrite this kind of uh, upgrade investment. Uh, we also get into the issues of uh, grid power uh, dependency for 911 calls. Uh, and some uh, recommendations uh, for how to address that kind of, uh, of, of uh, situation where battery uh, backup uh, is not as robust as we would hope it would be, both um, uh, at the premise uh, and elsewhere throughout the network. Um, we've gotten some very good feedback uh, you know, on what has been incorporated into the plan. Uh, and uh, have attempted to respond to that feedback with uh, recommendations uh, moving forward. Hey, Matt. Um, oh, that's I, that last, the last piece is just uh, okay. a section on PEG television uh, to talk about the importance of it uh, to our state, uh, as well as uh, a, a, uh, an acknowledgement of the Berkshire report uh, and uh, some discussion about uh, the um, the search and importance of finding a permanent uh, uh, ongoing financing option for PEG television, as well as encouraging general fund support until that long-term funding source can be established. And there you are. Well, thank you very much, Matt, and I apologize for- uh, Not at all. Go go quick here uh, due to my uh, little troubles with our uh, meeting owl. It is a cool device. I uh, wish we could get it to work. Um, so what's that? Yes. Uh, so you can see in the lower left hand corner, um, we're seeing uh, the room from my computer camera. Uh, so I think we'll start with um, taking uh, testimony and input from folks here in Craftsbury. We're in Craftsbury tonight. Um, and so what I have is set up here as a throne. And uh, when you want to give your comment, uh, just have a seat uh, in the chair here and um, we'll take your comment um, and, and then uh, we'll cycle through. And then once we're done with folks here uh, who would like to participate, um, we'll move to online and then to the phone. Uh, so with that, um, if I could just uh, take a quick poll of who would like to provide a comment. We'll start with Christine. Thank you. <clears throat> and and while we're uh, setting up here, if, um, if folks want to speak, uh, we're online. Just raise your hand, and so we can um, um, we can get that. Uh, there we go. So. I appreciate that. So with that, Christine, uh, just state your name and then um, provide your comment. I'm Christine Hulquist. I'm actually here. Um, I'm the administrator for Memorial FiberNet as well as NEK Community Broadband. So I'm representing those uh, two. But, um, and I'll start by saying, you know, that, that I think this is a very well-written plan, uh, both from a, from a technology standpoint, from a financial standpoint, and from a public policy standpoint. And, you know, uh, you know my experience goes way back um, uh, into the early thousands when we started at Vermont Electric Co-op, we started pursuing the smart grid and we really tested all kinds of different technologies. You know, we actually partnered with Northern Enterprise. I personally was involved with Northern Enterprise getting the fiber built early on because we recognized how important fiber optic was in terms of reliability uh, to provide uh, utility network data. So, and, and of course, serving Northeast Kingdom, 
we didn't have a lot of money, so we had to had to punt. And we dealt with wireless. We dealt with fixed wireless. We dealt with our own um, 900 megahertz bands. And it, you know, I can tell you from a technical standpoint, I totally uh, aligned with what the uh, the 10 year telecom plan talks about. We really have to migrate to fiber from a, from a, right, a, a resiliency um, and then pay attention when we design for redundant rings. And so that's all addressed in the plan. But from a financial standpoint, you know, if I take the, the information from uh, Lamoille FiberNet and the high level design that was done there, as, and I take the information from NEK Brownbed and extrapolate that data from their high level design, really come up with basically you extrapolate that state level and somewhere around 350 to 450 million is what we have to spend. So I, I think from, and I look at the financials that were in the plan, they were, they were good. And from a public policy standpoint, directing the money through the CUDs will, will result in the best effort. And I will tell you that I worked on both sides, the private industry, as well as the, uh, as well as in the co-ops. And I, and I've been always impressed with what uh, public boards can do. So with that said, you know, I will say that we, we as, uh, as uh, communication union districts, we, we definitely want to participate and collaborate in how we improve mobile wireless as well as public safety. Um, and in the plan, we talk about, and I can testify from my previous experience as CEO of an electric club, we have good, reliable emergency safety radio networks now. That's addressed in the plan. And so when we move to, uh, you know, digital online networks, we have to be careful about that. But again, CUDs could be central in helping that. And Matt will prove the fact that, you know, you get fiber out there and then it'll help get that radio uh, out there further. Uh, from a technical standpoint, you want to be careful not to get too specific around the technical details. I would advise that we have a technical advisory group as part of the, uh, the Vermont Community Broadband Board to really work on those you know, basically what are the requirements from a, and, what are, and what are the recommendations and then what are the procedural best practices. Um, so, so overall, nice job. And I also want to compliment the department. You know, I've talked to at least a dozen different design engineering firms across the country. And we have the best data in the country in terms of uh, GIS data and, and information, public, information available to the public. So I, I'm, I'm pretty proud of where Vermont is today. Um, we've all been, you know, around for a long time trying to work this. We made, you know, I can, I can tell you a lot me about the mistakes I've made, but, but certainly I think we're, we're all in a good place right now. So, thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next in Crassberry. All right. Thank you. All right. My name is Brian McChesney. I'm a resident of Craftsbury. I was the chairman of the broadband committee here in town that got uh, funding for and built out something over 13 miles of fiber to the premise um, across town. It's ended up serving about half of the addresses in town um, between the existing uh, fiber that the state had put up a number of years ago and the number of new fiber that we put up through the project. Um, certainly, any number of businesses particularly, but homes as well, individuals that now have access to the broadband service have said they actually can't remember what it was like when they were on uh, DSL. Um, you know, the level of performance, of course, is much higher, but even more importantly, the level of reliability is so much better than it was before. It's allowed them in some cases to retain employees where they were having trouble retaining employees before because it was simply too frustrating to try to do business in this part of the country. Um, so there's just been a lot of positive outcomes that were a little bit unexpected, frankly, and we'd like to see that done more. We'd like to do more to close the opportunity gap between rural and, and city type uh, dwelling and, and you know, really make the Northeast Kingdom an attractive place for people to live from that point of view. Um, that said, I have a couple of questions. My first question is, um, in the 340 odd million dollars that the department is talking about spending, is that for a dark fiber network only where the ISPs would come in and provide the rest of the infrastructure for the service? I suppose we can answer that 
question. Uh, I, I believe that figure is to, to provide uh, internet to every unserved address. But there's a there might be a considerable difference in the overall expenditure when you add on all of the switches, routers, et cetera, uh, access points uh, that need to be provided to to round out the dark fiber. So my question is. It, it was, I mean, it was a comprehensive analysis of the, uh, of, of all of those types of aspects. Um, and we got into some detail on it in the, in the plan of what we were uh, considering. Uh, so not just paying for drops or uh, those kinds of things, but in fact, uh, the entire network based on the, the information we were able to gather and the work that CTC has done uh, engineering similar projects throughout the country. Okay, so it would include the electronics as well, not just the dark fiber network. It, it would. Okay. Turn, turn key. Um, thank you. The, uh, the other thing that we found in Craftsbury doing this project was um, the firm that we contracted to do the design included a lot of slack in the, in the dark fiber. And we simply couldn't afford it. And as we talked to more and more people, we found that it was less and less necessary that the additional slack that was designed into the network was generally not found to improve the survivability or the ability to recover from damage to the dark fiber or to the fiber. So um, I wonder to what extent the department working with the uh, consultants have looked into basically, you know, middle mile kind of network slack. For example, if you looked at the, the network that the town has constructed, there's just a lot less slack loops than if you look at what the uh, what the department built. It was called what was it called Vermont? What back in the day when they put up the fiber that ran up through? Sorry, yes, the, yeah. the VTA. VTA right? Yeah, then the VTA fiber. Lots of slack, lots of snowshoes. Uh, right. Obviously, a well designed, well engineered, highly redundant uh, kind of service, but something we just couldn't afford. Um, so, I wonder how much do you think we might be able to save? And therefore, provide either better service to more people, or get into or get get service to more people faster if we collapse the slack down substantially. I think the VTA's fiber. I mean, they built it as a middle mile open access fiber, so that slack was put in there to accommodate all the conceivable uses of of the fiber, um, not knowing exactly who would use it for what when. I see. Uh, whereas your network's a last mile network, it's very clear that it's for residential internet uh, service. So okay. I don't, again, I think that the the estimate that Matt and CTC have come up with is is based on a network much like what Craftsbury has built. And okay, not like what BTE built. Yeah, and we did a separate report two years ago that estimated is the same cost at around 300,000 or 300 million, excuse okay. me. So uh, Matt's only increased this cost by 60 million or so. So it's in, in the same ballpark. Okay. But, thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your comment. Appreciate it. Uh, next in Craftsbury. Don't, you can touch it all you want now because it doesn't work. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Rudy Chase. I'm a Crassberry resident. I'm also on the Crassberry Broadband Committee. Um, I work along with uh, Christine Hallquist and, and over 30 member towns. Um, this has come at a great time and not so great time. We've just gone through COVID and we've figured out how important it is to be able to communicate in a time like this um, with Zoom meetings and being able to talk with other people that you couldn't you couldn't see. And so, uh, even though I'm on the broadband committee, I'm I'm really looking at this from the kind of average citizen point of view. Um, we've got thirty some odd towns in our CUD. And you're talking about a 10 year plan. And as I mentioned in one of the last CUD meetings, that's not going to be fast enough for a lot of people. There were doctor's visits done over Zoom and just, you know, infinity 
to what Zoom was able to accomplish. Um, I, even though I'm on the broadband committee, I struggle with why are towns having to band together to improve something that is painfully obvious now. This is a necessity as is water, as is electricity. Um, I had granddaughters that struggled to do schoolwork during this whole process because of broadband and connectivity issues. Uh, so I just, uh, as a as a citizen, I'm trying to um, have you understand that this is vitally important, and people in this state need broadband, um, and it it won't happen fast enough. But is there a plan on the state level to push this along at a at a greater rate than ten years? I know ten years might be the the stretch goal, but what are we really looking at for a town like Frasbury to be 100% covered with 100-100? And I'm sure there's other towns that, that feel the same way, and it's just, it's vitally important. I'm also on the hazard mitigation team here in town, and um, hazards can be mitigated if people can talk and communicate and where is the road washed out? And where is that bridge a problem? And those kind of things, as we've seen with things like Front Porch Forum and other uh, internet-based, uh, you know, connectivity. So I'm just, uh, again, as an average citizen, I'm just uh, trying to understand, uh, have you understand how how greatly important it is that we get this thing off the ground and uh, and and make it work as uh, short a compressed time frame as possible. And that's really all I have to say. Great, thank you so much. Just one one clarifying thing as the next person comes up, Clay, is that the 10 year telecommunication plan is looking at a 10 year time horizon, but that's not the uh, time horizon that we believe it would take pending funding to be able to build out fiber to the home uh, to all of the currently unserved and underserved re uh, locations. So, um, and we did talk about needing to move with uh, speed uh, in order to both uh, seize the opportunity and to be able to uh, uh, meet Vermonters where they uh, are. Hi, um, my name is Kristen Fountain. I'm not. <laughs> it's oh. been a long time. Um, I am a resident of the town of Albany. I currently represent Albany on the NEK Community uh, Communication Union District. Um, and I'm uh, the vice chair of the CUG. I'm also the vice chair of the Vermont uh, Communication Union Districts Association. And I'm just here to make verbal testimony on our behalf. We are, or have, I think maybe already submitted written comments that were approved by our board on Wednesday, but um, overall, we want to come out just firmly behind this plan on a high level. Uh, we strongly support its focus on community-driven, resilient fiber-based solutions. Um, our members generally agree with the top level finding and we're very pleased with the confidence given to CUDs and want to say that we are ready and we are in it and we're, we're going to make this happen for our community. Um, we agree that uh, the stimulus funds are the funds that we need to make this happen. We agree that CUDs are best positioned to use these funds because of our access to the municipal bond market and we can stretch these funds as far as they can possibly go. Um, we generally agree with the requirements proposed in this plan for accessing the funding. Um, we do caution um, putting too much specificity in say grant requirements in terms of technical uh, components. We think those are better uh, developed collaborati collaboratively um, and we expect that will be forthcoming. Um, we do, we, we actually support the concept proposed in this plan that the so-called pro-consumer values of net neutrality um, 
and open access be priorities? They are priorities for our CUD, but as we attempt to create partnerships to really bring service to all our members, we need to consider a variety of options. Um, net neutrality, for most of us, we will not agree to any a partnership that does not um, allow net neutrality, but you know, I think it, it needs to be a negotiating point. It needs to be possible. Um, open access means many different things to different people. And in a rural, primarily residential network, uh, that needs to be defined differently. And we appreciate the flexibility that that framework would give us. Um, we agree that the Community Broadband Board has work to do to establish specific procedures for determining what constitutes a conflict with the CUD Universal Service Plan, but we strongly believe that CUDs should have input on this point. Our Universal Service Plans are described by our business plans and by our network designs, and we believe that any proposal that overlaps with those network, networks as designed should not be awarded funding. Um, we also agree we need a strategy for expanding cellular coverage and strengthening public safety networks, and we want to be a part of that. So we hope to be involved in that conversation. Um, we have uh, specific points of critique, but um, we get into those in our commentary. Um, at a high level, uh, just want to say, let's work out the technical specs together, um, number one. Number two, um, we believe a low income plan is better thought of as a low income subsidy and should come at the state level or the federal level and that the cost of providing a low income plan should not fall just to the CUDs. We of course want to offer affordable broadband, but in the NEK, if we were forced to provide a low income plan, we could be providing it to half or more of our customers and that would make our business plan unworkable. So we would rather focus on creating a plan that brings the most affordable broadband to the widest number of people, and then you know, offer subsidy across the entire state. Um, let's see. The last couple of things. Um, the, the, uh, the PEG access channels, their work is so important, and they need, there needs to be a funding solution for them, as we've heard from so many great advocates who have spoken. But we really urge you to not increase the cost of rolling out broadband to our most rural areas. Do not um, increase our cost to solve this challenge. I, I know we can find a way that doesn't do that. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> if anyone, Michael, would you like to have a comment? I'm going to just slide the chair back uh, to my feet. Yeah. Oh, did I move it? No, it's all right. Uh, it's slowly moving forward. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Hello. So I'm Michael Murnbaum. Hello, Matt. Hello, Faye. Um, I um, am the owner of two ISPs. One is a wireless ISP, Cloud Alliance. The other is Fiber ISP, Kingdom Fiber. And I like both of them. I like both technologies. I'm technology agnostic. Um, the plan is written, I think is 90% wonderful. And I really support it. I'm here to offer some suggestions to improve it, but don't take those as criticisms of this name. Um, because I listened to a lot of the public hearings and online and, and the public comment hearings that preceded, um, I don't want to go to places that people have already been. So um, I'll take my time to mention some things I don't think I've heard um, on two topics even though I could talk all night on all of them, because I would love to, but I can't. So the two topics I want to talk about are how the plan addresses fixed wireless, and the other one is RDOC. 
So the fixed, uh, I'm looking at your plan here on my laptop and the, the conclusion that fixed wireless has strengths in some use cases, but it's not a viable solution on its own for the state's broadband gaps. I think it's a correct conclusion. I think it was arrived at with some incorrect data. And I think that because of that, there are strengths of fixed wireless that still belong in the state plan um, to a greater extent than they appear than it appears in the plan. Um, one thing everyone keeps mentioning is resiliency. There is no such thing as a single resilient system. There, every system has vulnerabilities. Um, in disasters, it's often that the wireless systems um, are back up faster and more um, more able to help um, get people connected and get people help. So um, that's one thing, one, one strong argument for fixed wireless. Um, the conclusion um, that fixed wireless is more costly than fiber in the long run, I think is incorrect. And it's based on I'm scrolling down to find them. Certain certain uh, data points, such as let me get to them. Well, I can't find them right now. Um, the cost per cost per um, passing for um, both fiber and for fixed wireless seem to be inflated. Um, even more so in the case of fiber. Um, in the case of fixed wireless, I think there was a, a suggestion that it cost $60,000 a year for a WISP to have space on the tower. Well, that's not a Vermont number. Um, we pay 1000 or 2000 a year for space on towers. Um, or we have our own towers that didn't cost that much to build, or, or we had help from state funding to build towers. The WISPs in Vermont have been very, um, well, we're Vermonters. We know how to use duct tape and bailing wire and all kinds of things to make things work. So we found very inexpensive ways to get antennas and radios on towers and on silos and on barns to deliver fixed wireless service for an economical um, total cost. Um, so when you start comparing the cost between the two technologies, it's, it's just kind of not fair. First of all, it's not $16,000 for passing for fiber, and nor is it, uh, I forget what the number was, for uh, $2,400. Oh, no, that's for upgrades. Um, it was higher than that for fixed wireless. They're both too high, and they didn't take in, I think those must be national or even urban numbers because the numbers just quantum uh, totals higher than they ought to be in our environment. Um, WISPs fixed wireless doesn't need line of sight. And in, in the plan, it states that um, it requires clear or nearly clear line of sight for optimum performance. It's just not true. It's true that certain frequencies will not do well without line of sight, but that's not true for all of them. And um, the CBRS frequencies, the 3.5 gigahertz frequencies that we're using now um, are doing fine through trees, just fine. And instead of, uh, there's a statement in here that you'll be lucky if you get 25 megs, um, per second from CBRS. In our certification testing for the department, we're getting tests in 60, 70, 80 megabits per second through trees. At great, oh, and I think it was, uh, no, there was a distance uh, qualifier in there too. We've, we've got a customer who is, I don't know, 14 miles away and is getting more than 25 megs. So the data that was used unfortunately wasn't accurate from our experience. I, I can't speak for others. I'm, I'm sure it was accurate for some places, 
and for some systems, but it's not what we've seen. And I hope and trust that the um, consultants did talk to Vermont WISPs and get data directly from Vermont WISPs. I can only say that our company was never consulted. So I don't know about others. There are a dozen WISPs in the state and I wonder if, if and how many were consulted. Um, so despite that, if I was given a choice, can I have fiber at my house or fixed wireless? I'll take fiber any day. This fiber now can do a thousand or 10,000 megabits per second and fixed wireless can do a thousand or maybe a little more with very special equipment if it's perfect line of sight and very short distance. But in general, most Vermonters don't need more than 25.3 or 25.8, which is what we can deliver easily. Um, they, most Vermonters do need more than one or two or three megabits per second upstream because upstream is really important. But symmetry isn't essential. Symmetry is wonderful. It's especially wonderful for businesses. But most Vermonters don't need that. So in the short term, fixed wireless should have a place in the 10-year plan. Not maybe necessarily the majority solution forever, but it shouldn't be given such short shrift. Um, Let me see if there's other notes I've made here. Well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think I've made the point I want to make, and I'll switch to Arda. So our company was the second most successful Arda winner in the state of Vermont. Um, and it's very relevant. And yet, generally speaking, the department and the consultants have assumed that any location that has been awarded RDOF subsidy should be considered served because it will be served by the providers who won in the auction. Well, I think it's correct to say that the providers who won in the auction will serve those locations. That's the nature of the auction. It's an obligation. If you get the support, you're obliged to do it. But it's naive to think that one location a mile away that wasn't RDOF subsidized should be 100% subsidized through ARPA or stimulus grant funds funneled through the state, through CUVs or otherwise. And then a, another location on the other side of that mile that has been has received RDOF subsidy in at the level of 20 or 25 or 30 percent of the FCC's model for what it would cost. And it's also naive to think that in isolation, those RDOF census blocks can be served for the subsidy that's been being provided, or even if they were 100 percent subsidized without them being part of a larger network that connects them because they're all isolated. They're all little measles on a map. And so they aren't large areas that, that economically work. Therefore, RDOF subsidized locations, depending on the level of subsidy that the FCC grants in, granted in the auction, should be entitled to some additional subsidy just like their neighbors getting potentially 100% subsidy. Um, in fact, the argument might be, well, you bid on it, you made your bed, sleep in it now. You took on that obligation. That's the argument I've heard from the department. And I understand that argument, but the department and the planners should understand that when companies bid in that auction, they were aware that there were other subsidies available. They were aware that there was other potential funding and that they 
were taking extreme risk and shouldn't be punished because they have won at a low level in the art of rock auction. So I think I've made my point. I think that RDOX locations should not be considered served or they should not be considered ineligible for any subsidy, any support. Can we provide support to your competitors for the same census block? Sure. Sure. I'm not looking for something special. I just think um, if we're getting 20% subsidy for one location, for one whole census block, or a whole group of census blocks, and our competitors are getting 100% subsidy, that there's no equity there. And yet we're, our locations are considered off limits, both in the uh, GMP and BEC tariff, um, uh, special tariff for make ready and, and potential um, awards of um, grants from the community broadband authority. So those are the two points I wanted to make. They're not criticisms of the plan itself, but they're uh, requests for reconsideration of those two issues. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do you have any questions for me? No. No, I think we're good. Okay. Uh, we got a lot of people. I have we got two people online, but Stephen, would you like to go uh, before we move to the folks online? Oh, uh, let's let's just do all the folks here, and then let's see if anybody has the time. Let's try to end the meeting now. Okay, so, Stephen, somebody has to leave. Would everyone be okay with Stephen giving his comment first, and then we'll move to the two folks on the internet? None that I see. There's <clears throat> no comment, just listening. So we're good. So I want to uh, second Michael's, both of Michael's major points. I'm glad. I had one of those on my list for tonight I could scratch off. That's the RDOF issue. But he added a lot more detail to that than I could have because I don't have a stake a horse in that race. Uh, I'm going to start with one paragraph from last night. This is not a plan that meets statutory requirements by any stretch. The statute requires addressing each of the goals of 202C. And that quote, in developing the, the plan, the department shall address each of the state telecommunication policies and goals of 202C of this title and shall assess initiatives designed to advance and make measurable progress with respect to each of those policies and goals. The assessment shall include identification of the resources required and potential sources of funding for plan implementation. There is none of that in this document. That's why I don't call it a plan. So. I think we've got a problem with uh, folks who are expecting money from you, uh, trying to flatter you when the law is the law and this plan doesn't cut it. Um, the served unserved counts, uh, also not included in these counts, the statutory goal is 100 to 100 by 2024, and that requires finding a a plan, developing a plan to deliver fiber speed service to all of those that are only served with 25.3 today. Stephen, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you want to stare down, Matt, you got to look here. Oh. Oh, Matt, you're on mute. I want to see his. Uh, right. okay. Come on. There's to uh, see your expression. Okay. I want to see your eye rolls and all that. Uh, you won't so see. Is not rolled that his the, eyes yet. The, the fact that this document does not come up with a strategy to deliver fiber speed service to all of those 25.3 addresses is a huge gaping void in this. Uh, and to say that it'll get there someday. But we also risk running out of money. This couple hundred million that we have is not going to be sufficient, especially if we dispense it in an experimental manner to a bunch of CUDs that have very little building expertise in a marketplace that is over overtaxed for manpower and materials, therefore driving prices up. So we're going to end up at a cliff where a whole lot of people are going to end up with nothing unless we incorporate some fixed wireless strategy 
to serve people sooner than the fiber can get there and to serve them in the event the money runs out. And we, we, have, we have planned something is better than nothing. And especially if we can do fixed wireless in a way that also infills the mobile wireless gaps. So I just think that that is the type of strategy that needs to be fleshed out in this plan if it's to be useful. It should not be adopted. It doesn't meet the statutory requirements. Uh, the idea of giving local control is not the same. It does not equal notwithstanding clause. There is no notwithstanding clause in the statute that allows any K broadband or any other CUD to negotiate away competitive choice or open access or net neutrality. Those are not negotiable. Those are statute. And to, you know, it's just, uh, it's misleading to let CUDs think that they're going to be able to bargain that stuff away in order to enter a partnership uh, because it won't hold up in court, you know? Um, so as far as the public process and the uh, effective public participation, I want to point out that the Telecommunications and Connectivity Advisory Board, uh, when this first draft came out, requested a table to be at the front of the plan that would highlight, that would expressly link each of the statutory plan requirements and goals to the sections that implement it and even recommend who might, who might take lead on each. That didn't happen. The Telecommunications and Connectivity Advisory Board is a statutory body to advise on the plan, and they were snubbed. They asked for a red line version, and I, I've never seen it, but I heard somebody might have gotten it the night before the last meeting. But to, in effect, snub the statutory body that's supposed to be giving year-round, full-time, full-on advice on this plan is absurd. You know, it's just so disconnected from what's supposed to be happening here. Uh, I made public comments, many public comments in writing uh, and some verbally, uh, most of which were just summarily dismissed or trivialized, not by professional consultants or engineers, but by a Department of Public Service staff person who didn't want to hear it, you know, pointing out that we need to first answer the question of active versus passive. We need to answer the question of how much we're going to be able to rely on the Velco infrastructure and build off of that for both central management, self-healing, and uh, evolving their ring network into a mesh network. That, that capacity, that speed, is, would save enormous sums of duplicative work that the CUDs are about to embark on. Similarly with pole attachments, if the DUs are able to build fiber most cost effectively, because they already have the crews, they already have the trucks, they own the poles, no make ready is necessary and no pull attachment fees apply. So those are fundamental things that might actually make it possible to accomplish this in the time required and with the money available. And yet those are missing from this plan or so-called plan. So uh, public safety should have a right of first refusal on all wireless towers uh, for placement with protocols for uh, resolving interference issues, if any. We need a map of the state fiber. We need a map of the state fiber access points. Uh, I think it's uh, a missed opportunity to have spent public money on installing fiber access points around the Northeast Kingdom, but have not, it's not made available access to any of the fibers that aren't already spoken for by uh, a local, one local business person. So to, to not make available fibers for competitive, for available for lease, still available for lease, or for fiber back, uh, small cell backhaul, et cetera, unless they have to go through a vendor who already leased some of those fibers, it was just a missed opportunity. We should have broken out more than those 48 fibers uh, while we were spending public money. So where are those fiber access points and how do they overlay with the gaps in cell service? 
if, if we know that we have gaps in cell service with frequent power outages, those should be our priority locations for installing small cell resilient sites for people to be able to call for help in, in extended power outages. That's the kind of planning that this should be in this document and it isn't here. And we can't wait three years. Uh, we can't wait. There's a lot of people who need broadband now, uh, folks who need to access telemedicine, people need to call 911. I know a guy who was, had a seizure, ended up in a wheelbarrow, wife had to wheel him into the house and run up a hill to get cell coverage to call for help. So I'm that, sorry, he ended up in a wheelbarrow? The, the wife had to load him into a wheelbarrow to get him back into the okay. house in order to go call. Thank you. So I don't think she wheeled him up the hill to the cell site. Gotcha. Uh, I think it's somebody you're aware of. Uh, there was mention in one of the responses that the state's not aware of any cell, uh, of any spectrum that needs to be inventoried. The department was supposed to have inventoried all the spectrum that could be available for broadband use five years ago, and it still hasn't been done. And I know the Vermont State Colleges have uh, a significant swath and some of the private colleges as well. Uh, they are an instrumentality of the state and they have spectrum that is currently being fought about in court, uh, which I would have hoped you would have been aware of and addressed in the plan. That's 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, uh, educational broadcast, broadband service. Um, resilience plan. Public dollars spares disaster plan. Um, I think I'm going to stop in favor because we're running late. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate I'll it. Pick up on the next one. All right, we'll move to those who are online. Uh, we'll start with uh, Angelique. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, and okay, we can great. see you. Great. Um, it's nice when the system works sometimes. Um, so my name is Angeliki Contis and I'm the executive director of Mount Mansfield Community Television, um, serving Jericho, Richmond and Underhill since 1997. I'm also the president of the Vermont Access Network, which as many of you know is made up of 25 community media centers in the state. Um, so just to give you our current context, in a normal year at MMC TV, uh, we produce over an hour of content a year. Uh, an hour of content a day each year um, and more than half of this is public meetings things like select board meetings and i can tell you that since march 2020 this number has greatly increased i believe we had 40 percent more content than in 2019 with all the virtual meetings and this year even more um, and i just wanted to mention that the the thing that's been super helpful this year is having one gig up and down Ethernet from a small local provider um, for a nonprofit like us who is in the audiovisual realm. This has been really huge during the pandemic, cut down on a lot of worries, allowed us to help out the towns and the nonprofits needing our help instead of us grappling with how we're going to um, communicate and uh, bring everyone together. So I um, am joining a chorus, it turns out, of community media center people weighing in on the draft telecom plan. Um, it's been interesting to watch it evolve and I guess it's almost there. Um, but we uh, wanted to let you know that we appreciate being included in the plan, um, but we do wish it would put a little more wind under our wings for the decade ahead. Um, the work that we do is focused on giving Vermonters throughout the state voice and connecting them. Um, and it has everything to do with this plan. I've been in the field for about a decade myself, enough to see improvements in a lot of the infrastructure around us um, in semi-rural Vermont, where I happen to be based, and many of us are in even more rural areas, which have even greater challenges, um, but we've also seen some lost opportunities and um, new threats to what we do. Um, for instance, while we all really cherish and one of the most valuable things we have is our old DVD and VHS archives, um, it, it really makes no sense in 2021 that we are still cable casting in standard definition and sort of dumbing down stuff we shoot on HD to get it out to the public. Um, 
And when it comes to funding, we all know the threat, the elephant in the room, while the shoe hasn't dropped yet, we know it will um, with a shift. And this is acknowledged in the report in uh, viewing habits. And it's nice to see that in there. Um, we know that we're going to face a real challenge in the next five years or more, or maybe less. Um, and just uh, the final point that you've heard in the recent hearings from others as well is, um, as you all know, and we feel the state has really appreciated and our towns have um, been closer um, intertwined with the work we do over the past year in the time of crisis. Um, a lot of us have been in the trenches and now the new challenge is setting up hybrid meetings with our towns and helping them out with things like owls and remotely operated cameras. I was just been troubleshooting in Richmond today. Um, and uh, we've made Orca, um, our colleagues in Montpelier, uh, you know, household name in Vermont with the work they've done with the governor's press conferences. That's been, you know, we, we didn't want to be in this pandemic, but it was exciting that we could step in and help out. Um, and we're all sharing the content and transmitting it in many households. Um, so we're just, we would like to see the plan to do a little more to future proof peg before it's finalized. Um, and we would like you, if you could take another look at that, um, PEG study, um, which was funded by the state and which has a lot of interesting ideas um, and research about how we could make the ecosystem for all of us 25 small centers on small budgets, how we could kind of take this moment when there's a lot of funds coming into Vermont to say, hey, wait, how are we going to balance the private and the public funding that's coming in, you know, for the benefit of all Vermonters? And maybe this requires a little more braveness, like maybe we don't just have to look at what other states are doing, kind of like we did in the response to COVID. We could kind of see maybe a little more about what works well in Vermont, you know, that makes sense for us today and like for a decade ahead. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much for your comment. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll move next to Leaf uh, Goldberg. I'm sorry, I can't see her entire name. There you go, Leaf, Leaf Goldberg, if you'd like to talk. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now, yes. But you can't see me. That is true. Okay. Sorry about that. No video on this browser. So my name is Leif Goldberg, and I'm the director at um, the Hardwick Community Television Station, following up with another testimony. And also um, a neighboring town to Craftsbury, where you where you all at. Um, thanks for your work on the on the plan. It's pretty comprehensive. So as a small rural uh, peg station with a small budget, we we cover a full range of local content, including all the government meetings and highly sought after sports broadcasts. And uh, what I hear most often from our community members is that they want to see as much local programming as possible. This tells me that small communities like ours care deeply about the opportunity to be represented. Um, so I was interviewed for the Berkshire PEG study back in, I believe it was January. And one of my questions was, um, how, how can HCTV continue to cover our complete community, including surrounding towns that are not within a cable service area and hence without cable funding, including uh, culturally rich towns like Craftsbury and Greensboro. Um, so I do believe a new funding structure for PEG could indeed expand coverage in an actual community as opposed to an area demarcated by cable lines. Um, and, uh, you know, we have done a ton of programming in Craftsbury, even though it doesn't lie within any cable service area. So I would really, you know, love to see some kind of funding structure that could represent the towns we actually cover and the community we actually cover. It's an interesting thing. Of course, we do, you know, our core work here in Hardwick and Woodbury and 
the little bit of Greensboro that is covered by Comcast. But we do cover these other areas around us too, and we do provide a service that the local local communities um, really um, look for. Um, so I do believe and hope there can be a way forward to fund uh, vital rural community PEG centers like ours, hopefully by way of new partnerships with this emergent technology structure, the new systems that are um, amazingly outlined in your plan. Um, but I hope you do please consider continuing your work to this end and uh, specifically, I encourage you to spend more time on the legal analysis of the Berkshire PEG study that I was a part of. Thanks, thanks a lot for your time. Great, thank you very much for your comment. All right, with that, we're, uh, I think we're almost a half an hour over time, uh, in part to our technical difficulties at the beginning. So I think we'll bring this hearing to a close. Uh, I appreciate everyone's comments tonight. Um, we'll have one more hearing uh, this coming Monday in Dorset at the Dorset uh, town offices. Uh, so if you're, uh, I guess if you're in the area, please stop in or um, we'll, we'll be setting up an, an online forum much like this. Um, so uh, with that, we'll close the meeting. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have more comments, please do submit them. Uh, online uh, or uh, to our email address, which is uh, psd.telecom at vermont.gov. All right, thank, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.